Hey everyone, uh, welcome back to the Black Brain Trust. This is episode 205. I'm here with my co-facilitator, Lionel. Hello, hello everyone. How you all doing today? How you doing today, Mike? I'm good, brother. Yourself? I am well. Uh, please hit the like button as you come in. Uh, share the video if possible, and there's a docket in the description beneath the video, uh, so you can follow along. O'Shea Duke Jackson, what's going on? How you doing, brother? Let me make sure I rent you up before we get started. Also, uh, just as an FYI, um, we're still doing mentorship over here for IT. So if you are trying to get into IT or need to make um, some transitions in IT, uh, we could definitely um, link up and mentor uh, offline, or we could do it on ear. I see we got a thumbs down already. <clears throat> so let me get That's started. That's funny. Uh, yeah, let me get started. All right, so first item on the docket is from SeekingAlpha.com. AMD maybe eating NVIDIA's lunch. AMD may be eating NVIDIA's lunch based on the last round of quarterly results. NVIDIA reported weak sales across most of its business units, but data centers stood out. It was the first quarter that N NVIDIA had posted declining revenue, both sequential and year over year for data centers since the first quarter of fiscal 2017. The disappointing results and worse lack of uh, full-year guidance may pose a severe problem for NVIDIA. And the technical charts suggest that NVIDIA's stock continues to struggle and falls in, in the coming weeks. Meanwhile, AMD stock continues to show signs of strength as its data center business continues to thrive. I recently noted in my premium service uh reading the markets that AMD stock may finally be breaking out. You can now tra track my success and failure rate from these articles on Google Spreadsheet that I created. NVIDIA reported fiscal first quarter results that beat analyst earnings estimates by almost 9%, while revenue beat by 1%. The company gave uh, a second quarter guidance that ha that was in line with expectations. However, one sign that management may be uncertain about the balance of the year is that the company failed to provide its full year mark, a uh, full year outlook on the conference call. The lack of transparency could be seen as a reversal from the fourth quarter call when the company noted that it expected full year revenue to be flat to down slightly. Data center fell uh, during. Uh, during the quarter to revenue about around $685 million. That was down almost 7% sequentially and 10% over year over year. Meanwhile, the gaming business, despite growing 11% sequentially, was down 39% year over year. Um, there's a lot that I can say about this. AMD had some uh, more positive views on the data center. On his first quarter call, the company noted that the company noted that uh, Risen and Epic processor data data center GPU revenue had more than doubled on a year-over-year -year basis. The company also went on to note that they are seeing growing customer interest in in their platform. Unlike Nvidia, AMD noted that it still sees the second half of the year as being strong for its data center. That sounds like the total opposite of NVIDIA's view. One can walk away from the two companies having to scratch their head. Either the two companies are seeing very different things or AMD is stealing market shares from NVIDIA. It seems, it seems most likely that AMD is uh, taking that share from NVIDIA. So I, I just want to summarize um, 
that uh, AMD's processors, and I've been talking about this since last year, uh, since we started this. Um, the the issue for NVIDIA is that they don't make x86 processors. So x86 processors are PC processors, um, things that work with Windows, uh, Microsoft Windows. They make graphics cards and they make um, other uh, uh, um, chip units for uh, dedicated processing, so what we call ASICs, application-specific uh, integrated um, uh, components. So NVIDIA can only go so far um, scale-wise scale with, their, with their processors. Their processors are mostly focused on graphics um, processing units, whereas AMD has a very diverse portfolio um, that focuses on x86 processors as well as GPUs. Um, and you take both of their processors and their GPUs together, and you have something very, very powerful for your data center, uh, as well as uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and blockchain development. Um, blockchain is what, was what um, Blockchain and Bitcoin is what drove the demand for NVIDIA GPUs and AMD GPUs and CPUs. So what we're seeing now is that because NVIDIA doesn't make central processing Unix, uh, they only make GPUs, that's starting to taper off and more companies who are looking to upgrade their servers in their data centers are looking to jump to AMD because they are the, they have the fastest product on the market and will probably have the fastest product on the market for the money uh, probably for the next year to two years, if that. Uh, and what's happening with Intel is that they're having a um, manufacturing issue with their um, with their Intel processors. And because of that, um, someone has to step in and fill that void, which is AMD. And that's why you're seeing all this, this growth for AMD. And you're going to see it for the next between 2019 all the way up until about 2022, 2023, maybe even 2025, if things work out for them and doesn't work out well for Intel and uh, NVIDIA. So if you're looking at stocks, you got to pay attention to AMD stock because it's going to shoot right through the roof if things go the way that it should. Uh, they just signed a deal with um, with Microsoft and, and um, Sony for, for the next gaming console. So that's a part of what's driving their growth as well. Wow. Yeah, I know you've been talking about this and being the drum on this NVIDIA AMD since uh, at least mm -hmm. since last year. And we've read throughout the months uh, of the troubles that they're having. Mm -hmm. And leading into this is all constitute, you know, you've been saying the same thing. We, excuse me, excuse me, to pay attention to their stock. So I can only say what you've been saying for the past year. Right. Right. Um, I just want to give a shout out on the chat. Uh, Dr. Yaya, good evening. Uh, Ghana Warrior, what's going on? Uh, Faber, what's going on? Rosie Rays, how are you doing? Uh, Joe Black. Um, Salchi, what's going on? Um, yeah, it, it's one of those things where... Um, if you're a AMD used to struggle, um, a lot of people don't know this who listen to this. They used to struggle in in the um, in the market. They used to have like one percent, less than one percent share of the market. Um, revenues were really down. Stock was moving at you know a um, dollar, two dollars. Now their stock is probably all the way up to twenty seven dollars, if I remember correctly, um, which which is uh, significantly higher than uh, what it was projected to be. So if they're talking about a breakout coming for for AMD, you can see their stock go up to fifty fifty dollars by end of the year. If everything, uh, if, you know, if all the moons and the stars align align together. So I'm um, good, Rosie. Was... <clears throat> yeah, I'm mad. I, I I had um, I thought their stock was going to go down to like forty nine cents or something like that, and then I would jump on, but then it. <laughs> It just exploded on me, so I I slept on it. I used to own the stock too. So
All right, this next one is from adafruit.com. Build an, uh, build an RFID scanner for blockchain uh, Raspberry Pi. Take your RFID tracking applications and ideas to a new level by sending the scan tag data to a global decentralized and distributed cloud platform. This project uses Raspberry Pi and, as an IoT device and the EOS blockchain as a global distributed platform. The IoT device scans RFID chips in key cards, fobs, patches, tags, etc. The tags can be used to uniquely identify the items they are attached to in order to provide proof of location and time in supply chain manufacturing, asset tracking, and access control applications. I'm not going to go into all this because we don't have um, a whole lot of time because this is like a whole project in itself. But um, I'll cover some <clears throat> just the gamut of what what was uh, done on it. So everything you need to build this open source scanner and to access your scan data, uh, your scan tag data on the blockchain is provided, including the Node.js software, pre-deployed um, smart contract D, uh, D app or DAP blockchain uh, account and private key. A simple web application is available to facilitate the real-time demonstration of end-to-end -end scanning, transacting, and retrieving of real IoT data on a blockchain. Instructions to build the device and to use the platform are provided in the next section. Um, so basically what, they, what they're talking about doing is something that we have uh, covered in the past on one of our hangouts about um, Raspberry Pis and Arduinos, uh, microcontrollers, and what the capabilities are uh, with these um, two devices. So, an R a Raspberry Pi is a uh, is a miniature SBC, so a single board computer. Basically, what you have is a chip, memory, storage, um, and network controller, and um, USB controller on all on one platform. And what that has done. Um, is is allowed applications to actually run and operating systems to run. You can they have their own operating system which is based on Linux, and the applications are all compatible. Um. Uh, with with uh, with, with the uh, OS that is running. So what they've done on this platform is they've allowed it as low powered of a computer as it is to be uh, an IoT device or Internet of Things. And what that has done is it has allowed it to be um, a part of a uh, blockchain development platform. So this is a uh, this is very interesting. What's going on, Tony Smith? Uh, yeah. Uh, what? Okay, so it's going to send. This has something to do with IoT, right? Correct. If I'm not. This is an IoT device. Okay, so now you have, and we we've gone over in the past, you know, to IoT to really get well. RFID is going to be used with IoT, and now you're converging that with blockchain, and now you have these devices that you can implement with the IoT. Yep. I'm not as okay. So I'm just going to say, yeah, I I I I understand what they're they're doing, what they're saying. It's just putting it into words I'm having a problem with, but I do fully understand what they're doing with this. They're creating smaller and more smaller hardware that's affordable that can go with these uh, fourth industrial technologies to be implemented more in a mass adoption type of way. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. This is like a, uh, it's a do-it-yourself kit on how to on how to build an IoT device and match it up with the blockchain. You really can't go wrong with this because all the instructions are there. Um, a Raspberry Pi is like thirty dollars. You can buy you, you can buy a used one for like ten bucks. So now you're talking about a uh, turning this Raspberry Pi into an IoT device, which is Internet of Things, into a blockchain node, and 
um, an RFID device. Uh, RFID means radio frequency uh, identification. So this is a part of that uh, growing of, of emerging technologies that we've been talking about uh, since we started doing this. AO says, uh, Mike, I got an off-topic question, if you don't mind, brother. Go ahead. Go ahead. Shoot the question in the chat. Now, quick question. These RFIDs, um, they're hardware. They're, you know, like you said, a small computer uh, board. I'm thinking about cars, um, shipments, put them in a container type of deal. Um, and I understand it is a do-it-yourself. It is on a more entry level to do-it-yourself, IoT slash blockchain. So on the entry level, just use my imagination. Well, use my imagination. What, how can, what, what could people use this for? Uh, Mary are the things. Um, if you had your house set up um, with uh, you know those smart locks and um, and things of that nature, like the uh, Alexa and stuff like that, you would actually use it on that. Um, so there's RFID tags that would allow you to uh, um, you know use it as a badge to uh, to get in and get out of your house, ingress and egress. Uh, you use it on things like uh, shopping carriages, for example. You would create um, tags on you put, slide the tags on a shopping carriage um for like a big store like walmart and then they can track it using that one little raspberry pi device <clears throat> and and what that would allow them to do is to count how many carriages they have and where the carriages are in in the uh in the store or on or in the parking lot uh if you don't really keep track of these carriages what happens is those carriages are 500 bucks a piece if you're if you're a small chain like piggly wiggly or or walmart you really don't want to lose any of those carriages, and they lose carriages all the time. Um, there's a whole, there's a whole industry behind picking up carriages out of, you know, on streets and th stuff like that because they can't track them. They have no way of tracking them. With this little device, you would act, be able be able to track all of those uh, carriages and make a lot of money doing it. Mm, that's pretty cool. Okay. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got to know um, Node.js, and you got to know a little bit about um, JavaScript. So, uh, AOX, uh, Mike, I was wondering, brother, I'm taking a very hands-on IT degree at my local community college. I will be getting the A-plus through one of the classes. Can I list? things I did in the classes. Um, you could, but most companies that are trying to, if you're putting this on your resume, um, you could put that as a part of your cover letter. But most schools should actually get you a, um, an internship. So uh, I don't know how old you are, but you can join something called, um, uh, I can't remember the name right now. Uh, you might be able to find it in, uh, um, in, as a meetup in your area, but um, they have internships that are like 90 days, and you can go in there and actually, uh, j you know, jump on a project that's usually going on. Um, it depends on what your skill set is. Uh, I know everybody, you know, A-plus is like the bare minimum of what people need in order to work in the IT industry because most companies won't allow you to touch, you know, certain – computers and stuff if they're in warranty without your A+. plus, That's just a part of the uh, contract agreements that they have. Uh, I know it used to be like that for Microsoft as well. Uh, they won't let you work on their servers unless you had your um, Microsoft certification. So you could list it on your resume, but what happens is your resume gets compared to another person who might have done an internship or externship. Uh, you, you know, nine times out of ten, they're going to go with the guy who already has the experience. 
rather than the guy who just has the you know the degree or the certification. My advice to you is to actually go out there and um, try to find an internship off of um, off of LinkedIn, um, and, and also download the Meetup app on on your phone. There's always groups and in, in, uh, major urban centers that are um, always looking for like move projects, uh, what we call IMAX installations, move and and, and um, ads and changes. Those are always huge at the uh, either at the first of the month or at the end of the month, um, because they uh, they make changes at the end of the month or at the first of the month uh, because they're moving people around. And uh, I know in certain cities um, they have all these sort of stipulations of whether or not who can move, who can touch what type of equipment, and so on and so forth. So a lot of the times, if it's overnight, um, what would happen is they'll need some contractors to come in, and that's where guys like you may come in and get your you know, uh, get your feet wet and actually start touching some of this equipment and start working on um, on projects. And what that's going to do is that's going to help you with project management skills. It's going to help you with um, networking skills and, um, you know, just experience of touching certain types of hardware that you may have not been able to touch had you, you know, tried to apply, you know, um, for a job uh, straight up because they want that experience. Yeah, I think it might be um, the Association of IT Professionals. I, I'm I'm not 100% clear because my area is vastly different than um, yours. But um, what I will say is that yeah, you should, you know, um, if you have a black tech um, black tech fest, if you can look that up on on your um, in your in your local area, there might be a black tech fest. There's always people looking for um looking to hire there. That's that's where you're gonna make most of your network connections there. Um Microsoft usually runs um uh some tech meetups as well um at their locations. Uh, I know we have uh here in Boston we have the NERD, which is a New England research and development um center for Microsoft. So they're they're always um open to bringing people on. So yeah, get your certifications out the way first. Um you know, you can shoot me a resume as well. I'll, I'll look that over, um, and, and make sure that your LinkedIn is clean. You know, make sure you have a professional picture on your LinkedIn, because uh, that's what they look for. All right, let me get to this next article. All right, this one is from youtoday.com. Uh, Smart contract creation cools in 2019. The creation of smart contracts has hit a snag in 2019, according to the most recent uh, Dyer report. After more than 4.3 million smart contracts appeared in Q4 2018, this number dropped by nearly 50% in Q1 2019. Looking at the bigger picture, one should note that the Q1 numbers in 2019, 2.2 million, are still higher than a year ago who, when the cryptocurrency market suddenly crashed. Moreover, it's higher than average amount of smart contracts that were created in 2019, 2 million. I think that should say 2018. Yeah, that's, that's wrong. In April, which turned out to be a glorious... A uh, month for BTC, there were there were around 950 million new smart contracts. The lion's share of the Ethereum-based smart contracts is coded with the help of a programming language that is called uh, Solidity. A certain amount of gas, which is treated as a network fee, is required for each instruction to be executed. Uh, Dyer has also analyzed the contribution of gas spent on transfer and smart contract calls. During the first quarter, 61% of gas was attributed to smart contract calls, which is 11% higher compared to the previous quarter. Back in January, Ethereum faced a major vulnerability that would allow bad actors to exploit its smart contracts and steal funds. The security woes were the reason why the uh, Constantinople fort got delayed. Um, Lionel, you're the uh, subject matter expert on smart contracts and blockchain. 
what do you what do you think about this? Well, the numbers. Um, I think my my thoughts are this: smart contracts, just like blockchain, well, just like crypto, came on the scene. Everybody was excited. You hear everything that can be done with these technologies. So everybody went into the pool. But now that you are in the pool, now, now that everybody was in the pool. And, um, the uh, not allure, but the I was like, I'll go a halo effect came off, uh, wore off. So people were like, uh, I get out, yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not too much going on here. It, 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 it went a lot of activity in the smart contract space, and also on top of that, Ethereum is known for smart contracts in the program language that it was it used to create smart contracts, literally, which is a hard programming language which creates like Charles Hoskins said cre which creates a lot of bugs you know it's, it's difficult to program in you're going to get a lot of bugs so it was a barrier the programming itself is a barrier so even though the smart contracts are declining well interest in smart contracts are declining people are still interested in it and then also there's talk of changing the programming language to a of the program albeit it may be on different platforms to a more inviting programming language that leads to less bugs because not too many people know how to code in solidity comparable to the other popular coding languages not too many people even heard of solidity prior to smart contracts so that is what I think about it. Um, smart contracts are not going away. It's just um, people have lost interest and the barrier is the coding language that is used to code in it. But once more iterations of it come out, there'll be more interest in it. Could you explain uh, in, in 30 seconds what a smart contract is? A smart contract is more is a code. It's the if then then if if this then that situation. So if this happens, then that happens. So if I go to a smart contract with Mike, what uh, and we say, well, I need you. I say, Mike, I need you to do this, and then I, uh, um, I need you to make a website for me, and then I'll uh, pay you in Bitcoin or well, uh, Ethereum, Ethereum. So Mike then makes the website but each step that he completes i will then lock before he does it i'll lock up ethereum in the smart contract so each step he completes ethereum will be released to him so by the end of the him completing the website all the ethereum that we agreed on will then be released to him so basically like i said it's a if then if this then that's um computer code What's going on, Nago? Oh, how you doing, Nago? What's up, fellas? How you guys doing? Just dropping I'm in, going, dropping in, seeing, seeing what the brain trust is up to. <laughs> I'm chilling, brother. Um, I know you got a question in the chat from Faber. Okay, let me uh, from uh, who again? Faber. Okay. All right. All right. So, he wants to know is it, is that what the sawtooth development environment is for? Since so few people know Solidity, uh, sawtooth is more, um, there's a slight difference between blockchain and Hyperledger, Sawtooth, Sawtooth is part of the Linux Foundation Hyperledger uh, suite. So, blockchain is has a consensus mechanism, and it has a with that consensus mechanism you receive a coin for, or some type of incentive for securing the network, the network with. Linux and Sawtooth, what 
what Linux has done is take took blockchain, took out the consensus mechanism, and they are now they're saying, well, we're going to create a platform for distributed ledger. So it's more centralized. Um, yes, you can implement smart contracts on these distributed ledgers on this hyper hyper ledger system. It's just with that, there's no financial incentive to that. It's more of they so they took out the financial incentive. So it's still a it's still a if this then that situation, if this happens, then this will occur. Whereas on the Ethereum network, if two people go into a smart contract and they put up money. So if if this, then that. So blockchain is really, you, you can say blockchain is dealing with consensus protocols and money and the fabric or hyperledger protocols that Linux has come up with, such as the hyperledger sawtooth, have taken out the consensus, decentralized consensus protocols and the money aspect. So it's more centralized and so they took out money. So it's somewhat still the same thing and those are the key differences between the two. All right, this next one is from HackerNoon.com. How online coding schools are helping to reimagine, reimagine adult ed education in tech. I think we might have covered this before. When Michael Kaiser N Nyman started the coding school, uh, Epic Codis, in 2012, he was simply solving a problem. He had difficulty finding people with computer programming skills for a software company he had funded. He had founded. It was nonsensical. Why did I have so much trouble hiring programmers? Why aren't people teaching uh, people how to code? Once I got the software company on stable footing, I turned to uh, to the education problem. Epicodis, which trains adults from technical and non-technical backgrounds for careers as web developers, was his answer. Epicodis takes students from zero to software developer in 27 weeks. Training consists of 800 hours of in-person learning, 80 hours of job pre preparation, and 150 hours of on-job learning through an internship. The school has two locations, Portland and Seattle. 53.4% of Epicoda students have verified full-time in-field employment within six months of graduating. Web developer and junior software engineer are the most common titles. Employers range from large companies such as Living Social and Nike to small startups. Still standing after five years, Epicodis could be considered a brick and mortar success story. Other in person coding schools, however, haven't fared as well. The coding, the, the coding schools, Dev Boot Camp and Iron Yard, are two such facilities that closed their doors in 2017, unable to sustain a profitable business model. As the dust settles and questions loom about some of the challenges in person coding programs face, another model has emerged that also aims to train students to enter the tech workforce as web developers, software engineers, and data scientists. This model doesn't work, uh, doesn't walk the runway, but has nonetheless uh, earned its face time. This model is, is is the online coding boot camp and is helping to reimagine adult education in tech. Here is a look at the benefits and challenges of both in-person and online programs, how, are, how online programs uh, use tech to imp, uh, implement social learning, and reasons why online coding programs are a viable path for training and employment in tech. An in-person support base is one of the benefits of brick-and-mortar coding programs. Instructors are in are available in real time to assist students, and peers can work with one another, building soft skills such as teamwork. Coding is abstract. Being able to understand what's going on with code requires mental gymnastics. It's challenging no matter how you, no matter how you're learning, and in-person is conductive and uh, conducive and uh, to that. You work with other people, different students who are struggling too. In fact, 
past research highlights the importance of designing online courses to pur purposefully include student instructor interaction as a lack of social interaction can be felt more accurately in the online setting versus face to face. An in person uh, coding program can uh, may carry an added social benefit, but it also carries an added cost as well. The cost of the physical space, says Sean Dors, uh, Dross, a co-founder of Hacker of Hack Reactor, a San Francisco-based coding school which offers both in-person and online boot camp programs. Challenges of having an in-person facility, uh, including an uh, anticipating the number of students, the amount of space needed, and how much space to lease. These are difficult questions for any small business, as uh, Kaiser, Newman, uh, Kaiser Newman says. Online coding programs are faced with the challenge of students accepting non-traditional learning model. It takes being open-minded, says Daryl Sil Silver, co-founder and CEO of Thinkful, an online coding boot camp uh, headquartered in Brooklyn. So we've been talking about, you know, getting your... Uh, getting your nano degree, getting your certificate in, in some form of uh, coding and, and going to a boot camp. Uh, this article is just pointing out the uh, obvious that uh, we, we've been saying all along. Well, I know you're a person who's uh, enrolled in a coding sort of nano degree program. Could you speak to that? Yeah, um, I agree. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The program I'm taking right now is Introduction to Programming or Udacity. And it's heavy. It's video based, so the te the instructors that are teaching it are te teaching it via video. They're working the the functions out on the video. Then it asks questions. Um, also, they have a community part to it where you can go and ask questions on the community part. It's not work intensive. It's no homework. You just have to com complete it in uh, the time that's indicated. And I do agree. I, after you have that intimate um, learning and you go to more of something that's more social and test your skills, test to see if all the work that you put in is worth it, then I, I agree. It's a known fact. One of the components you need to learn a skill is a lot of hours. You got to put a lot of hours in to learn the skill. So I, um, yeah, I don't say right. Well, Mike, did you ask me something? He's there. Hey, are you there, Mike? Mike, you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Well, I can hear you now. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. I was, I was asking, I was asking, can you, uh, could you offer um, your your experience as an IT recruiter, which, what you're looking for when you look for candidates in terms of software development? Programming. So, software development skills. Um, you're looking for people, first of all, who have a. Well, I'm not looking for so much entry level people. We're looking for people who have at least three, three to four, you know, good three years of development experience, um, having strong skills in, um, uh, in some of the methodologies, SDLC and so forth. Um, Understand, uh, understand SDLC, it. SDLC stands for Software Development Lifecycle. Lifecycle, yes, yeah. You know, you know, uh, understanding that um, coding, uh, you know, depending on, of course, what environment you're in, um, but you know, certainly understanding, you know, coding from a fairly significant level, not only from just baseline, you know, just programming, but understanding some of the other factors that you might have to deal with, like multi-threading and so forth. You know, really kind of. Um, understanding you know the, the 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 more intense parts but now i would have to say it takes a little more time to to develop these skills and and certainly with object-oriented programming and so forth these this is going to take a, a little while longer but really a good strong base 
base in, 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 in basic programming skills. And like Lionel says, you know, it's something that, you know, it's going to take a little time, but you're going to have to put a little time and effort into it, but it's something that you can pick up and become, I think, fairly experienced within, in, in really, we say two to three years, but really depending on any decent programming language, you've got a one year's good experience really in it and worked in a fairly, um, I would say, uh, you know, ramped up environment. Uh, that's that's going to serve you. It's going to serve you quite well. Um, there's so many openings right now in the IT field that you know a year, and if you do fairly decent on a basic fundamental programming test, you probably going to get, you know, you're probably going <laughs> to probably going to go to work. You're probably going to get a job. Um, I'm not trying to underplay it like it's that easy, but I, I actually do think that it is because it's really that wide open. All right. You follow what I'm saying, Mike? Yeah, that's dope. I definitely agree with that. Um, yeah. Software development, it, it has to be a part of your um, – well, I shouldn't say software development. I'll say software literacy. So software coding literacy is, is very important um, because you've got to be able to open up uh, someone else's code and, and be able to decipher something in, in a few minutes. And, and can't you can't Google your way out of this? Um, That's a fact. It, it's just a, it's just a it's just a, it's just like another language. If you you know how to speak Spanish, you know how to speak French, you know how to speak German, Russian, um, Portuguese, many op many uh, doors of opportunity are going to open up for you because uh, of your ability to um, understand linguistics. So people who speak second languages also can write a second language as well. So a person who can speak Spanish can probably write code just, just like that because that's the way how their brain functions. Exactly. And one of the key things you have to understand, a lot of times when people come in on jobs as developers, um, even from a first year or second year experience, you have to, Mike hit it right in the head, you have to really understand code because you may have to come in and back code. You have to be able to back code on some of the yep. stuff that, that some of these people have um, – have uh, have you know who may have been there previously, so you may have to fix lines of code and so forth, which you know um, is not that difficult because you have some people. Not everyone has the same competence level. Some people may have four or five years and are not that good. Somebody comes in with one year, they're very good. Also, um, and I would also say for some people, um, having some you know not only development skills but some um, DBA skills is also good. Not that you have to have that. But having that as well can um, can be helpful because that gives you a really good side or really good insight on both sides of the fence. I've always found superior programmers, um, high level programmers, have also um, had some level of DBA skills, which is kind of I know it's hard to get, but the environment that you get into can help you get that as well. And um, I just I just want to mention that, not to say that that's necessary that you have to have that, but if you do have database administration skills, depending on what type of um, programming language you're dealing with, is, is advantageous. Mike, would you agree, or how would you see that? No, well, I 100% agree with you. Um, couldn't, say, couldn't have said it better. And we covered an article last week where a brother went to one of these boot camps, um, mm -hmm. 26 years old, Tillman, uh, Tillman French, uh, grew up in the Detroit neighborhood where few people around him had jobs, received an associate's degree, hoping to eventually get a bachelor's degree and work as a financial advisor. Instead, he bounced from one unfulfilling job to the next in the hospitality and restaurant industries in the fall of 2017. He moved to Boston and enrolled, a, enrolled in a community college, planned to transfer to a four-year program. One day, a friend forwarded him an email about Resilient Coders, a boot camp that trains people of color uh, for web development and software engineering jobs on on a lark, Tillman French went to a resilient uh, coders hackathon, and the passionate staff there sold him on the opportunity. After he finished the 14-week program, he said he had over two dozen interviews. Uh, three companies asked him, asked him back. Only um, Houghton, uh, Miffin, uh, Milfin, uh, Harcourt uh, made an offer. So this brother right here went to one of those boot camps, and we I've been beating his drum for a long time. Um, and, and the goal just kind of laid it out uh, perfectly that you need to have that sort of skill set. Um, this brother was, you know, working on tables, busting tables, washing dishes and stuff like that, making probably minimum wage. 
he went from like eight fifty nine dollars an hour to, to damn near sixty five grand in, in just a matter of weeks. Everything I've been saying to you guys has been on point. Um, this article just confirms it, and the Gone just confirmed it. Uh, we're in agreement, so it can be done, and you can still keep your, uh, you know, your uh, <clears throat> your consciousness as well, uh, your, all your African features, without lightening your skin like some people do. <laughs> <laughs> It's real talk, man. It's real talk. <laughs> Hold up. All right, let me get to this next article from um, investing.com. Microsoft to spend $100 million on Kenya Nigerian tech development hub. Microsoft will invest $100 million to open an African technology development center with sites in Kenya and Nigeria over the next five years, the company said on Tuesday. Global tech giants, including Alphabet uh, Inc., which is Google, and or the parent company of Google, and Facebook, have been increasing investment on the continent in recent years to take advantage of growing economies with rising access rates uh, to the internet by a, a useful population. Microsoft will hire more than 100 local engineers to work in the new Africa uh, facility in both countries to cu customize its applications for the African market and to develop new ones on the continent and beyond, it said in the statement. In addition, it is an opportunity to collaborate with partners, academia, governments, and developers driving impact and innovation in sectors important to the continent, the company said, citing financial te uh, technology, farming technology, and off-grid energy. Engineers at the new African Development Center will build applications using artificial intelligence, mixed reality, and machine learning, Microsoft said. The company already has six other development hubs located elsewhere in the world. The new Africa Development Hub will also support Microsoft's established businesses such as Office, Azure, and Windows, the company said. So uh, we did a whole hangout on... Um, um, Black Tech Fest, uh, or not Black Tech, Black Tech Talk, sorry, uh, about um, African mobile development and how Africa is moving at a fast pace in terms of coding. Um, we just covered an article just a few seconds ago about coding, uh, uh, coding boot camps and a brother who went to a coding boot camp and how fast uh, of a turnaround he had uh, in development. Uh, the thing about Africa is it has a lot of, it has a lot of human capital. So the idea here is to cultivate your human capital so that they can actually write lots of code. So instead of H-1B visa, instead of all the uh, uh, American jobs going to India, you're going to see a whole lot of American jobs go to Africa now because Africa has a vibrant um, millennial uh, uh, um, population. I think like uh, two thirds of their um, two thirds of their population will be uh, that of uh, under 35. So when you think about how much, how tech savvy those people are already, even without uh, full running electricity, uh, that makes for a um, a robust um, uh, tech tech economy. Guys gonna know how to code, uh, database development, um, blockchain development, all all types of uh, emerging skills that are needed. In the black community in America, that stuff is happening right now in Africa, uh, and you see all the investment going into it. Um, I can't stress enough that you know we we talk about Africa being the uh, future of of of, uh, of of emerging economies. Here it is, right here. They they're not putting a hundred million in for nothing. You know that I mean, for Microsoft, a hundred million might not be much, but for for the continent, $100 million is a lot of money to put into something that you don't think that's going to um, take off. I mean, they're not putting that money into there for nothing. Um, what's your thoughts on this, uh, Nico? Uh, uh Yeah, my, 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 my thoughts are uh, totally with you on that. I know there are those out here who might sit down and think, hey, you know, uh, you know screw Africa and all that. But um, uh, I remember I was, we were having a hangout. Um, this was maybe about a year, year and a half ago over... Um, I think it was on. I think it was on BGS's channel, and we were kind of talking about you know some of the cutting edge development uh, that um, 
that's really going on over there. Some of this is even bleeding edge. And many of us kind of are kind of missing the boat on some of this. And it's within our interest to certainly um, uh, get heavily involved because that will also help us here. It's, it's, it actually, you know, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's a reaction that kind of goes both ways. So we could really, um, that, that could help us here as well. So I certainly um, uh, totally agree with everything you say, Mike, as far as us being involved and, and getting involved with that. As it's, uh, yeah, I think it's actually, it's actually critical that, that, that we do it. But, um, you know, for those detractors that might say, forget about that, just look at what, where most of the, the you know, new development is going on. If you really take a stronger look and you see the African continent as well as Asia, uh, a lot of that is happening. It's, so I believe it's within our interest to mom. Um, to, to seriously get involved in that. But, but Mike, you bring this up a lot. You talk about this a lot. And I, I say just, just mm-hmm. keep, keep that information coming constantly because uh, people have to be aware. Yeah, I, I, I will only second what you all said. I don't want to take this conversation anywhere else. I'll just second everything you all just said. Yeah, everybody else is on the continent except for us. So makes you wonder. All right, this next one is from sciencenews.org. A new artificial intelligence acquired human-like number sense on its own. Artificial intelligence can share our natural ability to make numeric snap judgments. Researchers observed this knack for numbers in a computer model uh, composed of virtual brain cells or neurons called an artificial artificial neural network. After being trained merely to identify objects and images, a common task for AI, the network developed virtual neurons that respond to specific quantities. The artificial neurons are reminiscent of the number neurons thought to give uh, humans, birds, bees, and other creatures the innate ability to estimate the number of items in a set. This institution, this intuition, sorry, is known as number sense. In number judging tasks, the AI demonstrated a number sense similar to humans and animals. Researchers report online May 8th in Science Advances. This this finding uh, lends insight to into what AI can learn without uh, explicit instruction and may prove interesting to scientists studying how number sensitivity arises in animals. Neurobiologist Andrea uh, Andreas uh, Nieder of the University of uh, Tübingen in Germany and colleagues uh, used a library of about 1.2 million labeled images to teach an artificial neural network to uh, uh, recognize objects such as animals and vehicles in pictures. The researchers then presented the AI with dot patterns containing 1 to 30 dots and recorded how various uh, virtual neurons responded. Some neurons were more active uh, when viewing patterns with specific numbers of dots. For instance, some neurons activated strongly when shown two dots but not 20, and vice versa. The degree to which these neurons preferred certain numbers was nearly identical to previous data from neurons of monkeys. Ah, man, that's uh, that's something, man. Um, and I think this goes into uh, deep learning, what they call deep learning. Let me see if I can pull up. Dastard. Because we've talked about this before. Yeah, that's like, um, that's <clears throat> what you're saying is computers learning for themselves. Um, one of the articles a while ago, how computers were taught, were taught themselves how to handle objects, um, that what they do with go through a computer simulator and where you have a computer hand, simulated computer hand, and it'll learn, it'll teach itself how to 
hold objects of different of varying weights and sizes. So they equated it to a child learning, but with the computer, they it can speed up that learning knowledge um, faster than it would a child to learn. So now, I think that's what you're saying. Computers teaching themselves. All right, this um, this item on the screen is basically from Udacity.com, uh, which offers a nano degree in artificial intelligence. Uh, so, the estimated time for this is four months at 12 hours a week. Uh, you can enroll by May 28th, 2019. And the syllabus, or the silly bus, is uh, deep learning, uh, become an expert in neural networks, and learn to implement use, uh, learn to implement them using the deep learning uh, framework by PyTorch, building convolutional uh, networks for image recognition, recurrent networks, for sequence generation, uh, generative uh, adversarial networks uh, for image generation. And then the prerequisites are just the introduction. Uh, pre prerequisite knowledge is um, uh, introduction, uh, and then neural networks, and then convolution convolutional uh, neural networks, recurrent neural networks, uh, generative uh, adversarial networks, and deploying a sentiment analysis model. So it's only four months. That's a nano degree. And um, I think Lionel has been enrolled here uh, maybe what, a couple months now. Yeah, I've been enrolled since February, uh, end of February. No, 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 end of January. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for uh, less than one of those, uh, less than one of those new iPhones, I think you can get a whole nano degree that's going to open up many opportunities for you, so. All right, let's jump into some uh, some space talk. What's going on, Ulysses? I'm good, gentlemen. How you guys doing? Good, brother. Good. Yeah, I'm over at uh, my daughter's good. cheerleading practice right now, so I'm trying to get away from uh, the background noise. But uh, I haven't been able to get in on the last couple of hangouts, man. I've been having dad commitments. So <laughs> good, good, good commitments to have indeed. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no, no complaints. Hold on one second. Didn't I hear that they said that uh, black fathers were pretty bad or something? That black men weren't taking care of their kids. Oh, we're oh, awful, so, man. Sorry. I, I didn't mean that. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> we're right, awful, okay. dude. We're, ter we're terrible. <laughs> okay. Move forward. Yeah, I, mean, I apologize. I, I apologize. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it's better to have that commitments than to have 12 packs of honey bun commitments. Hey, oh. Like Somebody time me out in the chat. Somebody time me out. Oh, you, need, out. you, you need to be timed out, man. Yeah. All oh, right, boy. This is from CNET.com. China's lunar rover makes unexpected discovery on far side of the moon. As the first mission to land on the far side of the moon, China's Chang. Uh, Chang'e uh, 4 couldn't help but make some enchanting discoveries. Its analysis of the lunar crust, however, was seen, uh, has seen the mission also make an unexpected one. In research uh, published uh, in the journal Nature on May 16th, scientists from the National uh, Astronaut Astronomical Observatory of Chinese Academy of Sciences revealed that the composition 
of the lunar surface at the south, south pole of Aiken Basin is a little different to what was expected. One core theory uh, uh, posits that the moon wasn't always quite as cold and dead as it is today. Instead, it likely began as a giant molten marble full of magma oceans. These oceans gradually cooled in depositing heavy uh, minerals such as the green colored uh, olivine or the low calcium uh, pyroxene deeper into the lunar uh, mantle. Less dense uh, minerals flowed into the top, giving the moon a series of obvious uh, geological layers uh, like a cosmic onion. The crust, the uppermost layer, is composed mostly of aluminum uh, silicate or <clears throat> pycolese. So, understanding the composition of the lunar mantle is critical for testing whether a magma ocean ever existed, as postulated, said co-author Lee uh, Chun Lai in a press release. It also helps advance our understanding of the thermal and magnetic evolution of the moon. Understanding the composition of the mantle gives planetary scientists more insight into how the interiors of the planetary bodies, including Earth, might evolve. The Chang'e's 44 uh, lander landed in the von Karmer, Karman uh, car, uh, crater, which lies on the floor of the south, south pole of the Aiken Aitken uh, Basin back in January. It then dispatched a rover, U-22, uh, equipped with a spectrometer that measures uh, reflected light. By studying the light reflected from the surface as the rover rolled along the von Karman, Karman the scientists were able to detect minerals and determine the chemical composition rather than seeing a, a lot, seeing a lot of uh, pygolase, pygolase, uh the rover detected a dominance of olivine and pyroxene. This is a uh, very interesting. Um, yeah, I, I want to keep in mind that. Go ahead. I just want to keep in mind that uh, people listening to this, they did this on their own. They actually went to NASA for help on how to get the get their. Um, get their lander and rover on the moon and, and NASA actually denied them assistance. So this is real talk that they did this on their own. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say that um, I think with the loose rock that the loose moon rock dust you see is called regolith. And you got it right. That's, that's, that's what it's called. And I think the, what they're saying is <clears throat> They landed on the far side of the moon, the dark side of the moon, because the moon is tidal locked with the Earth. It don't span. So, part of the moon, I'll say solidified, meaning that whatever that was there, the lava and the hot metal uh, froze last. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm thinking. I'm thinking that's what they're saying. And if it was, if it was lava. That means that the moon has a sort of a, albeit a dead core, because heavy metals sink to the bottom. Heavy metals tend to sink closer and closer to the center of a celestial object as it spins. Hence, why that's why we always have to dig for dig for gold, iron, platinum, um, and these other heavy metals because heavy metals sink toward the middle. So now, I think that's what they're saying. I uh, just by you know, the article, they say I think that's what they're saying. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting to know that the moon was uh, eh, yeah, it's interesting to know that the moon was flowed with uh, lava streams, um, flowed with this and flowed with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nagone, you have anything to uh, add to this? That's quite interesting, and I've done a lot of uh, research myself just over the years over the moon and its, its evolution and so forth and one side of the moon seems to be a lot smoother than the other um, and people believe that there might have been an impact 
on the moon where, um, you know, that whatever impacted it literally melted across the moon and just kept part of it, you know, um, uh, smooth or, 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 or less rocky. Um, there also seems to be some level of a, of, um, of a, of a, of a vibration still coming from the moon, um, thinking that that might have been, um, uh, you know, remnants of, of literally of, of that ringing of that, of, 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 of that, um, of that collision possibly, um, when we start to try to look at the, the origins of it. So, um, I, <laughs> the moon is just an enigma, man. I, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, I postulate it came from it. It spun from the earth, but it is hard to say w- where this thing came from. And it's just, there's so many things that are, that are up there that are almost, um, I don't know, an enigma, an enigmatic. I, I, I you know, it's difficult to say. Very interesting information that, that, that they're putting forth here, but uh, I, I'm getting so many different things of, as far as what the moon is, and some believe it's more hollow on the inside than we might believe, but now we're looking at lava tracks and so forth. Um, but yet, I don't know if we're looking at any level of, you know, there's no tectonics are involved, so if there is, the moon geology would be certainly even different maybe than we have here on the Earth, and yet it's 230,000 miles away. So, um, you know, something like that that's so close could be that much different. I, I don't know. I don't know, fellas. It's kind of, sh- it's, it's hard to explain. You know, it's just, it's just hard to explain. But this is, this is very interesting information. Um, I want to look a little deeper into that. But I don't know if, I don't know if you're aware of any of this kind of information that, that, that I've mentioned previously, if anybody here on, on, um, on the panel. Um, familiar of what I'm speaking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think being able to trace, uh, like, you know, minerals uh, and different types of uh, um, uh, metals and different types of um, uh, composites and things of that sort, being able to trace that stuff would give you some indication as to the, the moon's true origins. Because, you know, I think maybe just like a month or two ago, they had, they had just... NASA just released some stuff that was actually kind of startling. They basically said that the moon is actually in the Earth's atmosphere. I don't know if you guys, I mean, we may have talked about this. Yeah, I'm not um, sure. Maybe the, that's, that's because the, the Earth's atmosphere extends out to more than what, what we uh, previously. The, yeah, yeah, the, 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 right. the ionosphere and so forth. Yeah, but, but I mean, 230,000 yeah. miles away. Um, that's still pretty. That's still a fairly significant uh, a, a distance, and um, I guess for NASA to, uh, to 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 make that claim, I, I'm sure they they have their reasons for it. But man, that's that I, almost seems that that almost seems like a stretch. But but, but go ahead. I, I think the the reason was for it because the how the way they they uh, I know it's not a word technify the atmosphere. They saw that that still happens further out past the line in which the app they they previously thought the atmosphere ends and that and those those things happen past the moon also so that's why that's that's why they're they're saying that. Uh, i forget okay. how how that goes but yeah uh so. yeah i mean i i thought it was interesting nonetheless you know to basically say that the moon is now now to now say that the moon is actually in the earth's atmosphere um, so I, you know, that, that kind of changes the nature of uh, how we sort of understand, uh, the, the relationship of, you know, uh, you know, the earth moon, moon relationship. Right. And then the other thing too, is, um, it really, this is, this kind of goes into the realm of, uh, archaeo astrology. So if you're able to, if you're able to see what is on the moon and what's in its mantle, what's in, you know, if you can kind of dig in there and, and see what kind of minerals and metals and all that kind of stuff's in there, okay, that'll give you some indication as to, okay, is that, is, is it actually, like what, what Nagon was talking about, is it a chunk of the earth? Or is it, you know, if you go back to maybe, say, some of the, uh, the, uh, the Akkadian texts that go back to the, the, the time of Sumeria where they talk about basically uh, Tiamat, being uh, being hit, it was a, you know, a large explosion. So like the moon is basically a chunk of another planetary body that was that was in uh, Earth's orbit at a, at a time long ago. So 
these things would kind of give some sort of indicator as to what the moon actually is and what's on it. Me personally, I don't think they were around if I, I, I do believe that. Um, OK, I'll say this. I, I don't think they were around when two celestial bodies hit each other. You know, they that people had to realize how large these objects are. You know, it, it'll completely eradicate a lot of things Two, at the beginning of the formation of the solar system all planets and celestial objects and asteroids and all were not going in the same circular motion let's say clockwise it all everything was not going clockwise Every, some things were going clockwise some things were going counterclockwise so a dominant rotation had to be um naturally uh, sought out so what happened is things knocked against each other things knocked each other out of orbit things form so that's why i say i believe and this was with other scientific evidence that the moon was carved out of the earth because another large object carved a large chunk of i'll say the moon out of the earth and it got tidal lock in the earth's gravity well, you know, I, I tend to agree with that because we also do see that the moon every year, I'm forgetting the number, how many inches or so it, it, it actually moves away from the earth. So it's slowly like three, actually, three inches, something like that. Uh, I, I forget, I forget what, um, what the numbers are. And I, I apologize for that. But um, the, the, earth, the moon is slowly moving away from from the earth so it is um so something is you know so it's still it's pulling away from the earth uh it has a ring they they have gone to the moon you know close to the moon have the moon has some it has a resonant ring to it so they're saying that they're uh what's causing this ringing inside of inside of inside of the the moon and they're figuring maybe it's it's it's, it's this is still resonant of uh of a, of, of, a, of, of a very serious collision. So, um, you know, there's some really strange things that go on, you know, and, and if that, if the moon did come from the earth, then that means the earth must have been struck by something to release that level of, um, of matter away from it to, to, to ultimately, you know, get into orbit or, or, or around the planet. So, um, man, yeah, yeah, but I, I mean, I, I, man, this is this is, and there seems to be they're still trying to find some, some, some mis, some mysterious planet X that supposed to have some extremely long, um, uh, um, orbit, yeah, orbit, uh, or, 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 orbit around the Earth that that, that 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 it's supposed to be there. This this may have been been, been uh, one of these planets. They're still trying to find it. Yeah, so, that you know. Be- I don't know. True. Yeah, Planet X or yeah. Planet 10 or Planet... No, no, Planet 9. Because how... There's other... Hmm, I, I don't want to confuse people. But there, there's more than eight planets in the solar system in terms of large celestial objects. There's hundreds. It's just that the ones we know are large enough to be defined as planets. There are dwarf planets past Pluto. Um, and they, the process in which they found other planets, how they will look at a uh, asteroids in a or in a Kuiper belt or the or cloud. I don't know Kuiper belt or cloud too far. They found that something is pulling on these asteroids, and then they then they discover another planet out there. I think it was like Neptune or something like that. Now they're seeing something else that's pulling on these comets out far, far away from Earth, and which leads scientists to think there's another celestial object out there. So it, if it's far that far away, it has to, a it has to be icy, you know, because um, Neptune and Uranus are icy worlds. So that's 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 why they think that. Well, we seem to say they, there's, a, there's a, a certain level of what's called a gravitational silhouette that they that they see that that, that means that there's some 
body out there that's that's pulling on something. But I haven't really been able to see it. So I don't know what else to say, but the, the moon is an enigma. And everybody says, well, how could this thing be here? You know, how could we explain this and all that? But yet it's sitting up there. You know, it's sitting up there and, uh, you know, and, and on some nights it's, 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 a, it's a beautiful sight. So I, I don't know, man. I don't know. I, it's just, I'm just going to follow the information that continues to come out about the moon and the different theories that come out and see what makes sense. But this is, um, you know, this is, this is extraordinarily interesting. Um, and I believe once we ever do get maybe some real information that we can really rely on, I think it's going to be re- relatively shocking. And it might, you know, give us a whole different view as to maybe how our actual solar system actually even formed. Right. And, and we don't even know what's in the middle of it, below this, beneath, or what's beneath the surface, because we haven't really dug uh, beneath the surface at all. I mean, I think the Chinese are probably going to be the first ones to get, get there, though. Mm. Mm. I mean, we've been on the moon. You know, we've got Corbulite or whatever, the, you know, that, the, the, that we've got moon rock. We certainly have that. We've looked at it, and um, since we've been there, it hasn't. We haven't gotten a lot more information, so um, we haven't traveled around as much as we sh- we should have. It's and it's just, and even though it's a short trip, there is still, you know, a great amount of danger. It's ex- you know, um, you ex- exposed to a tremendous amount of radioactivity. There is no atmosphere, so um, you know, it's, it's a it's a short trip, but it's 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 it's, it's, it's a tough one. So um, you know, why we haven't been back. I mean, I've, I've seen some, you know, some um, speculations like uh, if anyone ever saw the movie Apollo 18, which I thought was rather entertaining. But um, but but outside of, you know, those types of, you know, maybe there have been secret missions that have been there. I don't know. Um, and then, of course, we've heard of um, alien uh, alien structures, ancient structures on the moon and all this kind of stuff. You know, I don't you know. I don't know how true any of that stuff is, but um Certainly, uh, the moon um, is is an enigmatic, enigmatic, um, <laughs> uh, um, you know, planet, you know, you know, body up there. And, uh, boy, it would be great if we could get some level of understanding of how this thing really got there and how it formed. It. That, would, that would that would elucidate a great deal on our not only on Earth, on Earth, but I certainly believe the solar system as well. All right, let me get to this next one. This one is from uh, the European Space Agency. Uh, ExoMars Mission 2020. During launch and cruise phase, a carrier module provided by the ESA will transport the surface platform and the rover within a single aero shell. A de- a uh, descent module provided by Roscosmos with some contributions by ESA, will separate from the carrier shortly before reaching the Martian atmosphere. During the descent phase, a heat shield will protect the payload from the severe heat flux. Parachutes, thrusters, and dampening uh, uh, damping systems will reduce the speed, allowing a controlled landing on the surface of Mars. After landing, the rover will egress from the platform to start its science mission. The primary objective is to land the rover on, at a site with high potential for finding well-preserved organic material, uh, particularly from the very early history of the planet. The rover will establish the physical and chemical properties of Martian samples, mainly from the subsurface. Understanding, or oh, sorry, underground samples are more likely to include biomarkers since the tenuous um, Martian atmosphere offers little protection from the radiation and uh, photochemistry uh, at the surface. The drill is designed to extract samples from various depths down to the maximum of two meters. It includes an infrared spectrometer to uh, characterize the mineralogy in the bio in the in the borehole. Once collected, a sample is delivered to the rover's analytical laboratory, which will perform uh, mineral, mineralogical and chemistry uh, determination investigations. Of special interest is the identification of organic substances. The rover is expected to travel several kilometers during its mission. The ExoMars 
Trace Gas Orbiter, part of the 2016 ExoMars mission, will support communications. The Rover Operations Control Center, ROC, will be located in uh, Turin, Italy. The ROC will monitor and control the ExoMars rover operations. Commands to the rover will be transmitted through the orbiter and the ESA Space Communications Network operated at ESA's European Space Operations Center, ESOC. Let me blow up that image. Um, I know you have anything you want to add to this. Um, it's not like they're, they're describing how they're going to get to Mars, which is a six month to a year trip, um, depending on its orbit to Earth. <clears throat> yeah, it just sounds like they're, like they're outlining their mission for their rover to Mars. It's the yeah, European Space Agency. Um, mm -hmm. that's just what it sounds like to me, really. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. Not to... Do you have anything you want to ask us? I'll go ahead. Oh, no. I mean, I'm, I'm always just curious about how, uh, you know, because in the back of my mind, I, at the end of the day, I, I'm always thinking commercial enterprise, you know. So mm -hmm. the first to be able to establish what types of... Uh, you know, rare metals, minerals, and all these types of things, you know, first one who gets to uh, lay claim to it, first one who gets to enrich themselves with it. So um, I'm always kind of looking at <laughs> these things with, with, a, with, a, with a pragmatic eye. And I'm always just kind of curious about what it is that they're looking to discover, what, they, what they're looking to go and research, what they're looking for when they go and dig into the ground. Um, it's just, just, it's just an interesting aside. That's all I've got on it. I actually agree with Complex on this one, um, but not to poo poo the article going landing a rover on Mars uh, currently in this time of human society. That it, it is a big thing. I don't want to diminish the uh, the height of what they're doing, but I actually agree with Complex on this. Not to laugh about it, but I do. But to say. To give people understanding, you have the inner planets inside the asteroid belt, and then you have the outer planets. Inner planets are called terrestrial, outer planets jovial, because they're big and all. So a lot of the planets inside the asteroid belt are made of the same type of material, because at the beginning of the solar system, things banged off with each other. So one planet got more gold than the other. Other, another planet got more heavy metals than this other, other planet. So some one planet may have more resources than the other. We already see that the moon has um, water ice on it. We already see that Mars has water ice on it. We already see that these asteroids have water, water ice on it. They have heavy metals on it. They have all of these materials on it. So the movies that you see of, oh, there's some super whatever, whatever on these planets. It's like a scare tactic in my opinion. But Mars will have metals on it that we don't have plenty of on Earth. And I do agree with Complex. You know, somebody's going to get rich off this. Like, they're they're rich. No question about it. They talk about there may even be diamonds in these kind of things that, that might even be um, possibly even harder than what we have here. So it's, you know, you're talking about, you know, mineral wealth that know an industrial um, mineral wealth that um, many many major corporations some of the big players in the game yeah. definitely definitely want to get their hands on and they're going to be the ones who are going to be sponsoring putting a lot of money behind them, many of these many of these missions so um yeah th there's no question about the, the the economic aspect to what this is going to bring no no doubt about it no 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 question about it All right, this next one is from CNET.com. SpaceX Starlink now launching Thursday. Elon Musk is 
SpaceX has announced a new launch date for its Starlink mission, with the takeoff now expected on Thursday. The mission will send 60 satellites into orbit via Falcon 9 payload to bring fast broadband to the world. The launch, initially scheduled for May 15th, was delayed due to high winds. Uh, due to uh, due to high winds, I'm not sure why it repeats it twice. Standing down to uh, update. Uh, satellite software and triple check everything again. SpaceX tweeted on May 16th. Always want to do everything we can to we can on the ground to maximize mission success. The mission is now scheduled to launch Thursday from Pad 40 in Cape Canaveral, Florida. SpaceX tweeted. The launch will be the beginning of a mega constellation that could see more than 12,000 satellites orbiting Earth to provide high-speed broadband access globally. The launch will be live streamed uh, at SpaceX's web, uh, webcast homepage with footage from uh, streaming around, uh, streaming from around 15 minutes prior to launch. So satellite-based internet uh, being beamed down back onto Earth for, uh, uh, for people, uh, for, for consumers. Mm-hmm. I watched it. Wrong with this. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I not to say yeah. I, I agree, agree with you. But um, I saw a video by um, CNET. Um, their correspondent was testing the five G networks here in Chicago, downtown Chicago. They they have nodes up already. Um, Verizon, and she was she had the Samsung S ten five G, and she was testing the speeds. She was getting a gigabit download speeds. Uh, upload speeds were not too uh, fast. I said it to say, SpaceX plans to launch 12,000 satellites. 12,000 satellites. And the payload that was going up, the amount of satellites in there was 60. So that goes to show you how many of, how many more launches they need to get to reach their goal of 12,000 to provide a global internet at that point only thing you need is a device the internet will be so ubiquitous only thing you need is in a device to access to 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 tap into it this is the launching of 5g 6g and any other new generation uh, of uh speeds this is what they're doing in the making right now. I was I was I wanted to watch it Thursday, but it was they said the weather due to the weather it um was canceled. I said I I suggest you all they is ever advertised. It's shown on YouTube. I suggest you all tune in um on the twenty third, which is three days from now, which would that would be what Thursday, and watch it. It's pretty cool. All right, let me jump to this next article. All right, this next one is from space.com. Could blockchain tech launch space faring na- um, nations into into a data sharing frontier? Data sharing between entities in space will be easier and more secure using technologies such as blockchain. An industry participant argued at the Humans to Mars Summit in Washington, D.C. on May 16th. Ari Toro, uh, who gave the speech, is a serial entrepreneur and founder of XYO, a network of internet-connected devices that are secured through a process called cryptography. He argued that spaceflight is among the industries that could use a form of cryptography called blockchain, which links blocks of data together. Each pre- each piece of data is associated with a unique, unique identifier, which also marks that data's position in in the chain, making it easier if a piece uh, is missing or has been altered. Blockchain is suddenly a popular topic. Tiro, uh, to uh, Rao explained, no conference or summit is complete until somebody stands up on the stage and says blockchain. He he quipped and added this added that this is true even of spaceflight. Security remains a challenge in the sharing of uh, sharing data in spaceflight, he said. 
which to be fair is also true of many other industries. That's why he argued Russia, China, and the United States all have separate GPS systems for navigation on Earth. It's because these countries do not trust one another. Blockchain all allows entities to share information with each other securely, uh, Tarao said. He likened data to human memories. Each participant may have a unique set of data to upload to a large network. Just like humans share memories and experiences to come to a greater understanding of the world, sharing data securely will allow spacefaring nat uh, nations to do better understanding their environment. In space, sharing data this way could improve navigation, especially in locations such as Mars that are remote and have little satellite coverage. He likened this situation to self-driving cars on Earth, collectively sharing information and nav navigating on uh, navigating an obstacle on the road. In space, satellites or spacecraft could provide relative navigational information to each other and thus improve the accuracy of their navigation or space-based positioning. Pinpointing satellites' location in space is important for missions such as uh, Gaia, which precisely tracks the movement of stars. Um, this is actually um, probably one of the most robust use cases I can see. I mean, we talked about this before, about... Um, Asteroids being put on a blockchain so to identify each unique asteroid and um, and actually monetize that um, its usage on the blockchain itself by tokenizing it. But we we talked about that months ago. I know, right? This 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 is a good application because when you go to these other planets, you are going to need others, other people's, um, other countries information because this this is a global initiative going to other planets it's not like one you know luxembourg is just going to go to uh explore the moons of saturn now they're not big enough this is a global initiative so you're going to need other people's information in the beginning you hit it right on the right there on the head once you start to populate then you start to get into the territory of like the expanse you know where you know you, you want to suffer stuff, stuff private but in the beginning you're going to need to share information just just to make it because if you don't and people start dying because you didn't have information of this asteroid here you know this this comet there then people are going to say well why wow why we're going to go into space see people are dying you know but if you hear information to you know to um, dodge that then People are going to say, "Okay, it's successful." So you know, we 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 doing a good job. So keep 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 up the good work. Well, I like the self learning. I like the I, I you know Mike likened it to self driving cars and how um, basically what they do is it's, it's sort of like it's collective learning or you know each each car receives data from its given environment and it learns it learns about what's going on in real time and then all that data is then collected and then dispersed back out and so what what happens is is that there's a constant update and an upgrade in the algorithm okay and then that's what over time will minimize the uh the the um the uh the chances for like any sort of like incident to occur or accidents to happen now you just take that thought and apply it to like space travel Right. So it's like, like I'll, I'll, there's some there's some um, animes that I watch, like Space Dandy, for example. And, you know, and, you know, there's some scenes in Space Dandy where there's just like a whole shit ton of ships out in space just flying around. Right. But they're flying in like these 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 lanes or like these zones, if you will. Right. So it looks very organized, even though they're out flying around in space, like how they they, they come into uh, um, another like planet or another body that may have some sort of restaurant or some sort of station or some sort of something on there how they come in and out and all that there has to be some sort of system right theoretically i'm talking theoretically at this point there would have to be some sort of system underlying it all that sort of manages it you know that organizes the data that disperses the data to keep something like that in an organized and structured setting like something like space travel and 
space navigation and all that. So I, I totally, I, this would be, to me, this sounds like, you know, it would make sense to have a, like a, a global cooperative sort of thing to take shape, which would then ultimately expand and grow out into, uh, you know, some, some sort of like a s space uh, exploration or a space navigation management system per se. Well, basically, they're, they're talking about creating a space highway network, right? So similar to Google Maps. Yep. Um, yeah, similar to Google Maps, you would actually, um, you would actually, you, you know, uh, um, you would have to um, make sure that that data is accurate, right? So the the integrity of the data is important because if you if you if you don't have the right updated uh, up to date uh, mapping system, you can end up you know flying into a um, you know uh, a, a fragment of, uh, of material the size of a baseball that could probably tear your whole your, your whole mission apart. Mm -hmm. Even uh, I saw a video where they were talking about this. Not funny, but um, just left because I saw a video. But they saw I saw a video where they were saying you know they keep track of particles that are in space so because they can tear up or punch holes into the ISS. And they were saying even paint chips can cause damage. I'm like, wow. Now, check this out. Facts. Right, these, right. These things are moving at such high speeds as well. Man. Now, check this out. Talk about, inf let's, 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 let's talk about infrastructure. Um, these satellites orbiting Earth and they create a outer space internet, which means you're gonna grow that. So you're gonna go to Mars, circulate that with asteroids, not asteroids, but um, satellites. Then you're gonna go to um, the asteroid belt and attach satellites to, to, to those. So now you have a potential internet where you cruising in space and you can still stay connected because what, I don't think people realize how large space is, the, the distance in between these objects. So it's not going to be cluttered. And then on top of that, as you're cruising through space, you can still be connected. And all planets don't rotate the sun at the same, you know, um, same way. You know, Mars may be on the other. I think Mars is on the other side of the sun for like two weeks or two, I think two weeks where you lose connection. So if you have a planetary, uh, solar system wide um, internet, you can still stay connected. This is like, wow. All right, let me get to this next article. This next one is from space.com. Trump's 2020 NASA budget will take U.S. from moon to Mars, agency chief says. NASA Administrator Jim Breitstein, or Breitstein praised the agency's 2020 budget proposal from the Trump administration today, March 11th. I don't wait, when was this produced? Yeah, this is a very old article. Um, yeah, we covered this too. Let me not um, go over it twice. Very old article. All right, uh, this next one is from space.com. How space station and moon missions will prep astronauts for Mars. There's a lot left to figure out before we can safely send humans to the red planet. NASA push, NASA's push to hu land humans on the moon in 2024, along with the agency's ongoing research on the International Space Station, could serve as excellent analog environments for a mission to Mars. Several researchers said at the Humans to Mars Summit in Washington on Thursday, May 16th. A group of researchers from the space agencies, private space flight companies, and other organizations 
around the world discuss how to best prepare for a mission to Mars. Such a venture involves several additional risks compared to an excursion to the moon. Among those risks, humans to, humans on Mars will have to spend long periods of the planet of the time on the planet's surface in an environment that could contain Martian microbes. Already, research on the ISS has helped NASA make plans to mitigate uh, some of the risks of sending humans to Mars, said Julie Robinson, who is chief scientist of the orbiting complex at NASA's uh, Johnson Space Center in Houston. For example, researchers have spent the better part of 20 years investigating the effects of microgravity on the human body. These, uh, these include weakened muscles and bones, fluid shifts, and cardiovascular deconditioning. There is less risk of some of those health issues today. However, due to research on the ISS, Robinson said, we know more about my, how microgravity affects the human body now than we did before the ISS launched more than 20 years ago. But Mars remains tough. As we look at the risk of uh, risk for all design uh, reference missions that could be done, the most significant would be a human mission to Mars. Oh, she said. Robinson added that NASA's plans to add humans on the moon would provide useful data for ISS missions, which take place uh, fully in microgravity. Watching people adapt to gravity in the lunar in lunar environment where they weigh one-sixth as much as they do on Earth, provides an idea of how to get ready for working on Mars, a slightly larger world than the moon. Mars has gravity that's approximately 38% of, of Earth's. Robinson mentioned, uh, uh, Robinson's mention of lunar and ISS analogs for a human mission to Mars was was also taken to uh, taken up by a representative from the German uh, Aerospace Center (DLR) and another from Duke University, although their talks focus on other topics. The big unknown on Mars is the possible presence of life," uh, said Lisa Pratt, NASA's planetary projection officer. Her job is to lead a team to reduce the risk of Earth equipment contaminating the Earth. I mean, I mean, contaminating the surface of Mars and to prevent nasty Martian microbes from being transferred back to uh, our own planet during this uh, future sample return missions. Microbes, so, that's what they're afraid of. Yeah, I find that to be uh, extremely <laughs> interesting. Considering yeah, that some of, these, some of these people let their dogs lick them, so... Yeah. That dude. <laughs> sounds like total. We know what that sounds like. Then we go over an article where they were catching gonorrhea. These astronauts are catching gonorrhea in space, and 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 now they want to go to Mars. It should be the other way around. Like, well, you know, yeah, huh? No, I was gonna say it's kind of hard to put a condom on in space. Right. So it should be the other way around. Mars should like you know we gotta, you know, they come here, so you know we gotta make sure they don't bring none of that stuff here. Gonorrhea in space? What? Yeah, we covered an article they was yeah. catching. You know, gonorrhea. They, yeah, we, we covered that article some months ago. Yeah. And how how were they catching this from each other, right? Yeah. Dirty. Dirty. Oh my gosh. Anyway, moving right along. <laughs> Microbes. I heard I heard Robin Perkins was uh pretty out there himself, so <laughs> raw dog. What are you going to say, Lino? No, nah, I was just laughing at the fact that that was going on. Yeah, I, I did. I did have. A, I did want to say something, though. Um, you know, I, I don't. With all of the, with all the research, like when you look at like um, some like the humanoid robotics systems that like Boston Dynamics, a few other firms have been able to create. I just don't understand why uh, they haven't just gone the exo the, the vr exosuit route where essentially you know they they're going to send humanoid robots that are controlled by humans here on earth 
right? So you're going to stick on, you're gonna, you might get into this, this machine or something, stick on a VR headset. And it, it, it's almost like being in like Iron, Tony Stark being in an Iron Man suit, right? So how they kind of, they stick this thing on their head and then they kind of get the sense that they're in this robot, but the robot is actually just there on Mars doing the work and they can actually move around and do much of the same thing that you would do as a human, but you would just kind of do it in this VR environment and then the robot over uh, on Mars would actually carry out the task. You know, as opposed to all of these different um, studies and stuff like that on, okay, well, can the human body sustain this type of stuff? I mean, I think that the robotics has just gotten so advanced that, you know, they may actually just need to take that approach. Well, I don't think they will use uh, VR headsets. I mean, artificial intelligence, we just covered an article where artificial intelligence with deep learning is actually capable of um, over 1,000 um, identifying 1,000 objects uh, on its own and um, self-propagating so, so itself. So, Oh, are you allowed to deploy the, AI, deploy the AI then? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of that stuff has been discussed. Uh, but the question is, how do you keep a robot um, from depleting its battery life? Like, how, how would it recharge itself? It's not going to walk around with solar panels. So it would have to be a, uh, a um, nuclear-based robot where they have... Um, I know the Russians had worked on this some a couple of years ago, but um, a micro um, base, um, no, not, not a micro, a, uh, a nano. They had a nuclear pattern. reactor. Didn't they have like a like a, a like a small little nuclear reactor the size of a battery or something like that? Yeah, it was a it was a uh, it was a capacitor. It was a yeah, nuclear right, capacitor. Right. So Yeah, so a, a super capacitor would actually give it enough energy, but, you know, for how long, right? Um, it, it plus, it, it would have to go some rigorous testing because it's going to absorb all this radiation, and we don't know what the radiation would actually do to it because there's nothing protecting it, right? Um, so it would have to be made of titanium or some other uh, rare material that could actually uh, absorb all that energy. Well, well this, if you're looking at it, something like that, absorbing that kind of energy and and not having a proper way of dissipating it, you're going to have an explosion. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Could be nuclear. <laughs> I don't know if you want small loops going off with these things. Well, I mean, it, the, it, the capacitor itself would, would be the, would be the uh, energy source, so I don't think it would yeah. actually... Uh, you, you would get fission. It, 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 yeah, it, it, it would actually uh, be the size of a, um, of a cell phone. It's, it's the nuclear capacitor, so... You imagine something like that is in, in, in the battery life. I, I should probably pull up the article, but the battery life actually lasts for fifty years. Yes, yeah, that's that's significant. That's significant. Yeah, that's very significant. You know, um, Complex has talked about hemp-based capacitors and things of that nature uh, mm -hmm. in the past. So, if he wants to speak more to it, he should go do it now. Oh no, I mean that that would these that's what the application for that type of stuff would be. You know, for, um, you know, battery chemistries that may not uh, do well in certain environments. You know, um, I mean, that's that's the reason why, you know, that that's kind of just on the on the business docket, if you will, is to explore, um, you know, hemp battery technology, because, you know, you never know what type of environments um, certain may will require certain types of battery chemistries. Absolutely. That's a, that's a fact. This is open mic, so we can uh, we can get it in right now. Okay, yeah, I'm just trying to step away here so you guys don't hear too much of the noise back here. I, I just wonder if anybody from the chat has any questions. Yeah, I think I think the chat kind of slowed down. Um, at least for me, it has. Let me refresh my page. Um yeah, so let me um let me let me let me get into this uh some of the stuff that we've been covering this week or what's gonna be covered this week on Saturday. So Saturday's gonna be a uh, black tech talk on 
uh, cloud computing and networking. Um, I'm hopefully trying to get uh, Dewan Lightfoot onto the onto the panel. He came by this weekend on the uh, Black Cultural Intelligence um, talk with um, myself, Dollar Will, and uh, and um, Paul Bryant. We're talking about hip hop as a science. So that, that I hate that I missed that one, there. man. I hate that I missed that one. And we, we, can we do a part two to that one, Mike? I'll even bring up some part. things. We're going to focus on West Coast. West Coast have our rip up. Oh, that's Rap, right up my alley. Yep. Murs. Yep. Yeah, Living Legends, Quantum, so Project Blow, all that. Yeah. And then tomorrow night we got um, Black Cultural Intelligence again. Uh, focus on racism in the workplace, you know, um, some of the recent events that has propped up the last few months, you know, with um, Facebook and Google and things of that nature, um, a lot of black people are going through, going through the, uh, you know, getting, getting put through the ringer. And it's also the you know the 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 reason why too you know we we push for uh, you know our own sort of our black startup culture because you know we have to start to create you know uh, companies and businesses that that deal with emerging technologies and things of that sort where you know where you have full control of the workplace environment and you're not subjected to it. Yeah, but you know, but the, but the fair thing is, totally agree, and we definitely, you know, you know, I think we definitely need to be moving very aggressively in that direction, as as some are. Not to say that we're all sitting back, we're just waiting. But um, the fact that many black people use Google and 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 black folks are huge on Facebook and so forth, at a certain level, this shit is unacceptable, and um, you know, folks need to be. Um, really cold and really hard, harsh on, on that, especially Facebook and, you know, Google and so forth. We, we, you know, it's, black people going through the ringer for what? That's why folks say, we, we, what's their reason for that? Black people are very active in these areas, very active users of, 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 of this. Unacceptable. Yeah, it is. It's embarrassing because um, I watch uh, the World Economic Forum uh, with uh, IBM on there, and they were talking about the fourth industrial, uh, fourth industrialization a few months ago. And um, uh, Jim, Jenny um, Romick uh, from um, IBM, the CEO of IBM, has talked about how how they want diversity. And I think what's happening here is that um, you have the PR people saying they want diversity, and then what's happening at the uh, the, 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 the sub C level is that there's an agenda by certain pale faced people to maintain a uh, sort of um, Eurocentric posture of, of white males in, in, in these spaces. So that's that's uh, typically what's going on for the most part and why there's so, so many microaggressions and stuff like that that you're starting to see in the tech sector. Um, typically, the tech sector is usually very liberal, especially Silicon Valley in particular. They are very liberal. But you also have uh, liberal racism, and, and a lot of people don't really understand that. They seem to think that uh, racism only comes from one uh, one sort of part of the party or one sort of uh, part of uh, politics, and that's not the case. You know, uh, it knows no race. I mean, it knows no uh, political party. I should say. Yeah, accurate. Very true. Yeah, so that we're gonna be focusing on that tomorrow. Um, hoping that Dollar World comes through for that. Um, and maybe Nicole, you can jump on as well. Um, yeah, I'll be here. And, and then Wednesday, Thursday is business as usual, geopolitics, crypto, cryptocurrencies, and then Friday economics, and then Saturday is the uh, Black Tech Talk, and then uh, maybe Sunday we'll probably have a uh, cannabis hangout. Cannabis, yeah, we'll have um, I have the docket ready. We'll, we'll we'll circle back around to cannabis on Sunday. And and, and also have uh, you know um, uh, Black Cultural Intelligence again talking about. Uh, West Coast hip hop um, as a science and how it how it impacted the uh, culture. Yeah, I got I got um, I got a whole lot for that one. 
yeah, hopefully AM1 can get on for that because I know he's from the West Coast. Yeah, he's, he's, he, can, he can tell you about the – because he and I have chopped it up about it, man. Like, he could tell you about what was going up on – what was going on in NorCal? I could tell you what, what was coming, what was going on down here in SoCal, but th- there was also a lot of like going back and forth too. So there used to be like times where I was up in the Bay Area a lot, you know, getting active with people who were doing things up there, and vice versa. So Cali has a real interesting history, and it goes back a lot farther than than people think. Yeah, Richard uh, Victor Dixon says uh, hit him up for the uh, docket when. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I don't know if, if the South ever had uh, hip hop though. Uh, that's always been the question, right? Was Southern rap ever hip hop? Yeah, you know there was groups. Uh, there was groups like uh, y'all so stupid. Okay. Do if you remember them, man? There was a group out of Atlanta, um, back in like maybe like '93. They have a joint called Van Full of Pakistans. Look that, look that up. I told my 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 do my 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 hip hop knowledge is encyclopedic. Dude, I was a DJ, so as far as hip hop, yeah, yeah. What about Luke Skywalker, man? Look at Luke in the boy. Well, he <laughs> that's that's booty music. That's I mean I don't know. But there's some hip hop related. It's definitely booty music, man. I, I'm not. Gonna even I know that's 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 that's. But that, but it, but it, but it was hip-hop, I think, man. but see, we getting we getting into we're getting into rap, and then we're getting into hip hop, right? Like in the distinction between the two, right? Okay. Because the two, the two, the two have have very distinct cultures, so. Well, the, the, all part of the one family. That, though. The group that the group that you mentioned were were they the same as the uh, Laffy Taffy guys? No. No. no, no, these dudes were like, um, gosh, that's what I'm saying. Like, go, go, uh, that song. It's, it's called the song's called "Van Full of Pakistan's." And just check it out. They were like, a, they were just like a rap group. They were like a hip hop group from Atlanta, from like the early '90s, and they were dope. You would, you would have thought that they were from Oakland or something. Yeah, kind of like Souls of Mischief, maybe. But a lot of people really didn't know about them. But they actually. They were actually sort of like they preceded Outkast. That's kind of having like an original hip hop flavor coming from the South. They were, that was like the first group that I could think of that comes to mind, dude. That really were kind of like on their own shit. And uh, and then they later they later went independent and they were they were a group called Mass Influence and they they like regrouped and then came back out like in maybe like right around the turn of new like right around two thousand they came back out. But also, you had uh, Arrested Development. Them too. Man. Yeah. Speech. I, I, yeah. I was in uh, fifth or sixth grade when they came out with Everyday People. Yeah. Man, that was another group. A real jam back then. Yeah, that was another group, right? So, like, the South did have, the South had a very, they did, man. As a matter of fact, dude, like, I remember, I remember back in like '98, man. I went down there for a family reunion. And I ended up running into like Peanut Butter Wolf and Mad Lib and all, you know, uh, all the dudes from Stone's Throw at the Underground Mall. This is back in like 98, man. And we were chopping it up for a good minute. And we were just kind of surprised at how vibrant like the scene was down there. It, it, it's just that you had media kind of pushing this one thing that was coming out of the South. And y'all pretty much know what that stilo was. But there was there was definitely like other movements taking place down there. So I was well aware of it. I was well aware of it. There, shit, uh, groups like the Micronauts. Uh, they were from they were from Atlanta. Um, I'm trying to think of some other groups. Uh, my boy Lil Psy, John Robinson. He is from Signs of, Signs of Life. They they were out, they were out of they came out of Georgia. They came out of there. Uh, God, who else came from out of there? Now I really get to thinking about it, dude. There's a bunch of like dope groups that came from the South. Yeah. You know, the Black Brain Trust will have its own hustle and flow. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, I mean, Mike, you got people, people, you know, oh. yeah, you got Mike, people in the chat, you know. Yeah, no, I was just saying that you got people in the chat who call us socialists, you know, um, Trying to talk about hip hop too. You know, I, I, I'm not. I'm not really uh, feeling all that. So, 
Uh, I was going to I was going to say can we can we can we kind of can we sort of openly address uh the political views of the brain trust so we can dispel any kind of manosphere 2.0 discussions please Yeah, I mean, we um <clears throat> Uh, we operate as an intellectual co-op um, and do information dissemination as well as um, business modeling, um, fourth, fourth industrialized modeling. And we uh, don't charge any fees, so this is nonprofit um, driven. So we don't have super chat enabled. We don't have, you know, cash apps or cash me outside or whatever that shit is. Um, you know. Uh, we we don't we don't we don't beat people up you know for money. We don't we don't do things like that here. Uh, it, it's a different different sort of operation. We're very uh, politically agnostic. You have people on the left, people on the right, uh, people who are capitalists, pe- people who believe in other forms of economics, um, and that's just how we operate. We don't we don't really have any sort of. Uh, globalized views that align with some institution or something, you know, some other think tank. We, you know, we are a think tank. So that's pretty much the, you know, for the most part, uh, what we represent in a nutshell. Uh, we, we're not trying to, um, you know, sell you EVs and cars that you think are ugly and, you know, aesthetically ugly. And, you know, uh, we're not trying to take away your internal combustion engines you know, pickup trucks and Confederate flags. We, we're not here for all that. Um, we, we're, we're definitely here to uh, teach and be taught as well as uh, disseminate information. So, Yeah, I just, well, I just thought it was important um, that if, if we can kind of, because there's a, there's a lot of people, I guess, you know, the Brain Trust name is kind of making its rounds, if you will, and uh, uh, people are are checking this out, and um, you know I was on a on a hangout where we came up. Uh, this was like last Friday, and you know some of the questions that were asked by some people that really weren't too familiar with this. You know they were kind of saying, you know, what do we have an agenda? Do we have a manifesto? Um, we do. Um, it, it was it was something that we 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 laid out in. Uh, our one year anniversary live stream from what maybe like a little over three weeks ago um and so we right yeah yeah april 28th so i think that was episode 189 was that is that the, i think that's what it was i think it was episode 189 you know uh, we we laid out what what manosphere 3.0 is okay we, we we put this out there we so there's if if there's any question, if, there, if, there's any, if there's any question as to what it is that we stand for or what it is that we're about, um, that, that hangout specifically, and then the preceding black cultural intelligence um, hangouts where we go in depth into the acquisition of the three intelligences and you know, how, they, how they must be applied or why we should acquire these, these three intelligences and uh and and pursuit of things fourth industrial based okay that is that's basically that's that's the foundation of of what this is that the brain trust is built on okay so there's no mistakes to be made there's no um there's no there's no uh hidden agendas really you know there's nothing it's nothing like that there's no there's no um there's no opinions Quite honestly, um, there's there's none of those things that that are going to serve as sort of like the the points of uh, of, of conversation f- over here anyway. Over here, that's not w- that's not what it's going to be. It's going to be the information itself. It's going to be what's taking place in industry. It's gonna it's going to be those things, and those things aren't you can these are things you can have opinions about, but they're not opinion based items that we're discussing. So that's kind of where if, if you see that there's a reluctance by the brain trust to engage in uh, spirited debate based on opinion, okay, we, we, we could do that and we typically either do that offline or we'll do it during a time like this, for example, where we're kind of in the free, the free chat time of, of our live streams. But 
the, the actual news items themselves and the discussions that are had uh, as it relates to them aren't necessarily about our opinions. And they really and aren't. It's, and it's really not a political debate. It's not about politics. It's not about, you know, right wing or, 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 or left wing politics or who's a Trump Biden and who isn't. People can believe in Trump or not. People can, you know, believe in whatever. But at the end of the day, you know, it's going to come fact based. Uh, articles are being read. Um, real information is being put out. And um, that's kind of where where this is. If folks do have opinions, that's fair enough. But, you know, this is not about dissenting opinions. You know, this is, a, you know, more or less about coming in with real, real facts, real information. So basically, if somebody's coming in, they're saying something that is totally wrong or off. Present real, you know, information or empirical data that would actually countervail that if that's the case. And if someone needs to be corrected on that, then that's fair enough. But on the whole, this is not really a political um, debate, though, you know, one can express their you know, like you said, their opinions, if, if, if they if they want to in, in an opinion section. But overall, that's that's overall just, just not the case. This is not a, a Trump game or a, a communist or a socialist or whatever, whatever, whatever is or ism one wants to, to, to lay on it. This is really about what's what's kind of going on, what's currently impacting, you know, um, our community, our, our world, uh, you know, you know, on the whole and. And, um, and, and, and what are some of the answers that folks are coming up with and, and dealing with this? And that's, that's kind of where, where we're at on this. Would, would, would I be incorrect in saying that, fellas? No, no, you're not, you're not incorrect at all. And I just want to reiterate what you just said, um, mm -hmm. because a lot of the things that we're discussing, it doesn't matter what, um, what the political orientation, right, of whatever yeah. nation exists, okay? You know, all of these things are going to be prevalent right in these societies whether it's whether it's a communist society a socialist uh you know shit republic you know capitalist whatever whatever you whatever you want to give it right somebody some somebody in in the in these uh in these environs uh is in the blockchain some of these people are into cryptocurrencies some of these people are into hemp and cannabis. Some of these people are, are into, you know, all of these different things, right? It doesn't really matter. That's why I'm saying, okay, we're, we're largely, an, we're, we're apolitical, or we're politically agnostic, if you want to give it a, 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 better, uh, a better term, because it, it has nothing to do with uh, political agendas, really. It has to do with an industrial in agenda. And a cultural one. I know. Do you have any commentary on this? I think my note's gone. Um, so, okay. Uh, my my emphasis behind what you all have been saying so far is that um, it, it's uh, it, you know, we're we're not uh, politically centered on 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 anything um that we discuss. So, uh. You should walk. You should be able to come into the to the, to the hangout, whether you're on the panel or, or you're in the chat, and walk away, um, feel like you learned something. And that's part of our goal is is, is the uh, teaching experience and uh, information dissemination. So, uh, I I urge a lot of people to actually um, follow along with the docket uh, because there's a wealth of information that comes out of these um, that comes out of the uh, docket, which is why we post the docket in the first place. So we cite our sources. Uh, we're not like some other platforms that just uh, kind of give you uh, pseudo esoteric uh, um, uh, work where, you know, you can't really find out where they got the information from. They, they just tell you it and then, you know, they're gone with the information. So there's no way to ver verify what they're saying. So when we say that Africa is, is on the forefront of the fourth industrialization uh, of, of, uh, of uh, the economy coming forth, you know, coming forth, we're not just making this up. We've covered, we covered probably two dozen articles in the last 90 days that, that has discussed, you know, uh, millions and billions of dollars being poured into Africa on the continent, just in tech alone. Um, and what you have is people who want to tell you that, um, you know, that uh, Georgia or Atlanta, you know, is, is, you know, they have the best GDP in the union. 
and all this other stuff, and that Venezuela is a socialist state, and that you know the, the leaders leaders should leave, not realizing that the leaders of those countries actually protect uh, melanated people. You know, why would you want to see those those uh, those people suffer at the mercy um, of uh, of warring uh, uh, people who don't have the best interests of them? So, well, a, a lot of people just don't have facts. Um, you know, a lot of information is erroneous. They they they're running on maybe um, certain talking points that certain media outlets may may, may put out there, but yet, you know, um, the ones unsophisticated, not really looking at maybe what the maybe what the real picture is, and that's just a part of what of what exists out here. So, um, you know, you are going to go against that, but the name of the game here is um, you know, let's stick to what's really going on. Let's stick to the real articles. Let's stick to the to the information, um, let's disseminate and um, and talk about things intelligently. Just not not in a screaming, ridiculous you know fashion that um, makes very little sense. Well, I mean, I was and just going to say that. Sex. I'm and sorry, you're not going to find us talking. You're, you're not going to find us talking about uh, um, you know get, getting with women a lot. Uh, not because we knock anybody else who does it, but you know our focus is, is pretty laser. On, 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 you know, uh, what our intentions are. Uh, I do a lot of mentorship. You can see it in the chat. Uh, people email me all the time. They've been doing it since we've uh, started these hangouts. And, um, you know, I've been right on the money nine times out of ten, 99.99% of the time. Um, I've been accurate on my assessments of what I think is going to come down the pike. And I've yet to be proven wrong by any of these um you know, naysayers who want to come by and say that, uh, that, uh, you know, we're socialists, you know, we don't believe in capitalism and all these other isms, you know, um, mad ism, whatever it is. Um, yeah, there's somebody in the chat, you know, uh, um, says that it's time for the manosphere to compete in Africa at the billion dollar level. Huh? Whoa. Um, uh, any of you guys want to take a stab at that? Um, well, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not, I guess, uh, <laughs> how do you, how do you respond to that one? Um, I'm not, I don't, Okay, we, we, we happen to collectivize, right, on YouTube. And the area of YouTube we happen to collectivize uh, in is an area that, that's referred to as a manosphere, and then in particular, the black manosphere, right? So I guess by virtue of all of these things, uh, we are part and parcel of the manosphere. However, what, what and I, okay, I'll speak for myself, and then, you know, perhaps everyone else maybe wants to clarify their positions. Um, what I do, right, in terms of my own business uh, objectives, you know, and, and, and that of my partner, uh, anti-gravity. Um, now, it is it's not it's not uh, it's not related to or or it's not like a, a representative of this quote unquote manosphere like that. We're just we're here doing what we do on YouTube, you know, as far as our, having our discussions and doing our, our, uh, our analysis. On, on things geopolitical, tech, uh, and IT related, you know. But what I do in business in the real world um, has very little to do with the manosphere and vice versa. Okay, um, because I mean, I don't look. I I I, I look at I, I look at the manosphere in largely a, a 2.0 uh, scope. Okay, I don't I don't really see much of a 3.0 agenda in many venues. Primarily ours is maybe one or two others, a couple others. Okay, but by and large, I don't think that taking a, uh, a, a, a globalist approach um, to say to, to industrialization projects in Africa, wearing um, Manosphere 2.0 glasses, I, it doesn't work, right? So, so, I mean, I don't see the relation really I think what we're doing is in the manosphere, we're putting information out there and we're trying to encourage brothers to, to take a more industrious approach 
to the world, but I don't see us trying to corral the manosphere to do that. Like that's not my job. That's not that's not what I'm here for. Yeah, this is really you know really talking about putting a lot of information um, really out there. I think that's that's the key here. If you really want to talk about manosphere, uh, you know, uh, get involved um, in Africa at a billion dollar level, well. You know, um, if that individual in question feels that we should be doing that, you know, have him start to put up, you know, his half a billion or whatever he may have to really start to get involved. Um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you know, um, we're putting out a lot of information that those who were looking to, you know, form some really strong relationships. Mike and others have talked about this. So there's some stuff going on. But if those who might want to be facetious or think that, uh, hey, we need, to, we need to go do this. Well, you know, put your money up as well. And uh, we'll all check over there together, you know, and make no mistake and make no mistake. Um, you know, that 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 has taken shape. OK, so we have had some we do have some participation, you know, so brothers in the manosphere are also uh, like I said, you know, I, my business partner, uh, you know, anti-gravity. I mean, th that's how we linked up is through, you know, a lot of our activities in, in, in you know, in this this whole manosphere thing, if you will. You know, and then how, you know, how we kind of coalesce all of us and, you know, how we've been in, uh, involved in, in projects that, uh, that each other has going on and stuff like that. So that's a natural extension and an outgrowth and something that uh, is definitely encouraged. Absolutely. But first and foremost, it's it's really to put the information out here in such a way to where if somebody asked the question, well, where are the solutions? Where are the solutions? Because in Manosphere 2.0, that, that seems to be like the, the, the question that does not have an answer. Well, where's the solutions? What's the plan? What, 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 okay, you're only going to get to that point if you have the hardcore discussions, right? And if you take your, your, you know, your, your beliefs and your opinions and take that shit and put it aside for just a second and deal with the facts of the matter. OK, then that's when that's where that's where solutions will be found, you know. So, um, yeah, you know, you'll hear a lot of like, you know, and again, you don't you don't hear you don't hear us talking about women and stuff because a lot of like a lot of their concerns. Right. With regards to what men are doing to build and the solutions and this and that, they wouldn't know it if it slapped them in the face or if, you know, they popped in on a black brain trust live stream. They wouldn't know it. They wouldn't be able to hear it or recognize it anyway. So we understand this and we recognize this and we keep it pushing. And this is this is the only thing that I, I'm, I'm really trying to espouse here is that there's a different mindset that pervades over here. It's a different mindset. There's a different there's a different agenda. There's different conversations that will be entertained and a lot of the old conversations won't. I know you have anything you want to add to this. No. Yeah. Um, my closing thoughts on the Georgia peach. Um, is that, uh, you know, they go on to other panels, they talk about us, but they're scared to come back here and actually have an actual intellectual dialogue with us because, um, they know where they stand um, in, in the squared circle. Uh, we, we've given people a, um, many opportunities. I've hit many people up behind the scenes. I'm not going to mention any names, and, and you know, and ask them to come through, and they and they kind of uh, blew us off. So, um, you know, it, it's just one of those things. You know, people people kind of know where they stand uh, when it when it comes to us. Uh, you can say a lot of things, you know, uh, on other people's panels, but you can't come here. And actually say that to us, you know, we'll even give you fair fair opportunity to uh, set it up on a neutral platform, and uh, we can have it out there. But uh, in terms of in, in terms of uh, how you see us and things like that, we know where we stand. We have our own uh, position that we've already presented a few minutes ago. That uh, th this is where we stand, and this is where it, this is where it ends. You know, and this is where it's going to be going forward.
I mean, you got men. That's all. That's all know. I have on it. That's all I have on it, man. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I don't yeah. Want it. yeah. yeah. Um, you got men, you know, uh, blowing kissy emojis at us and stuff like that, man. You know, they had every opportunity to de demonstrate who they can actually be on this platform, and they failed to do so. Um, but like I said, keep that same energy when we get down to Georgia and wave that Confederate flag pretty, uh, pretty stout in the wind. Let me see. Uh, Oh, Richard Dixon, um, email me about um the mentorship uh that you wanna you wanna set up, you know. Um just let me know. Go straight you you should have my email. Um if not I'll email you after the hangout. Yeah, so to all you high performing capitalists, um, you know, enjoy the rest of your night. <laughs>